like that. Okay, so then I'm then my first move is to put it on my Facebook, and my second move is oh, we're live. <laughs> Hook me up with a link, holy sister. <laughs> One morning when Pharaoh woke in his bed, <laughs> there were frogs on his nose. <laughs> this is my new corona mask. <laughs> frogs on his bed. Stacy, can you hook me up with a link so I can post it on my Facebook? Frogs here. Frogs there. Frogs are jumping everywhere. I don't know what is. <laughs> I thought that would be so funny. <laughs> uh, and then I got on. <laughs> and then I got on to Zoom. And I think everyone at JIC is going, what in the world is going on? Why is she in a frog costume? Um, I think it's like Parshat Sav. Like, <laughs> 
So anyways, I want to thank the whole team at JIC for hooking it up, always being there for me, setting up the technical aspects. And I want to thank the dear Lord. Thank you, Hashem. Wow. Thank you, Hashem, for costumes. <laughs> and thank you, Hashem, that we have holidays. And thank you, Hashem, for all this crazy stress that some people might be enduring, that it's really such a... It's such a holy process what we're going through. Um, and so first we're gonna do some dedications and shout outs. Then I'm gonna spend a lot of time just giving over my favorite Pesach prep, the favorite things you can do at your Seder, the favorite Kavanot you can have. And if we have time, we're gonna tie it into Eliyahu Navi. That was the white beard. That's what I was going for there. Uh, I'm going for like, if I was Eliyahu Hanavi's wife, then I think I'd wear this. <laughs> so that's why I put this on. Uh, and if we have time, we'll connect it to the Parsha too. So anyways, welcome. Thank you so much for learning with me. I feel very special. I feel very happy because that means more people get to hear the cool Torahs that I learned. Uh, so dedications. First of all, a dear friend in Los Angeles is having surgery right, right now. So please Hashem. For the refuah shleima of Ariella, Rus, Bat, Bracha, Ita, may you have the biggest refuah shleima, may all of the energy of this Torah be like streaming into your surgery room, and may the doctors know exactly what to do to Meta Kenyu perfectly. Also, a dedication to the refuah shleima of my Ima. Um, also, today was the Lubavitcher Rebbe's birthday, so happy birthday to you. Thank you for mekaraving me. And I also want to give a shout out to Eliyahu Navi because this is really his holiday. And I just, you know, actually, for some reason, every Shabbos, I light a candle for Eliyahu. Um, I'm just really into him. You know, he's the bearer of good news. One Purim, I dressed up like him and I walked around giving out notes saying, <laughs> good news. I have good news. Would anyone like good news? So may he come and bring us his good news tonight that Mashiach is here and ready to rock and roll. Other shout outs go to the awesome people who are always sending positive feedback and their support. Aaron Eldridge, Nama Hall, Jonathan Friedman, uh, Rifka Lea, Jade, Shloma Meir, Jay Levin, Gavin Marsden, Lexi Grace, Yoni Gross, Sruli, and Sarah Fruchter, Lenny, Tova, Leibovic, Douglas, um, Avi Aboud, Ben Reski, and the whole Chevre. Just thank you for being here. Okay, so we're just going to begin with some fun, okay? Like, what do we do? Pesach is coming. We have like basically a day and a half left just to figure out our cooking and cleaning. But there's some really other cool costume, not costumes, but customs that I want to share with you. Uh, and first and foremost, it's so interesting. I was reading in the book of our heritage, really recommend this for all holidays, that it says that we should decorate our table as lavishly as possible. Now, disclaimer, before I go over a bunch of really fun minhagim and intentions that you can have at your Seder, I want to put out a disclaimer. None of this is to add stress. None of this is to add burden. Only if it's fun. Only if you find you have the time. Maybe it's an art project for your kids. Um, but please don't ever feel less than because I'm presenting all these ideas. I work as a teacher, so this is my job, okay? But only if this provides fun. If this doesn't sound fun, throw these ideas in the trash, okay? So, but this is actually not a cutesy teacher idea. Um, Rebbe Eliyahu Kitov explains that decorating the table on Pesach, you should go no holds back. Like, you know how God says whatever you put into Shabbos, that money and effort will come back to you. Or actually in this week's Haftarah for Shabbat Hagadol, it talks about how God actually tells us to test him with tzedakah. He says, you're afraid of giving tzedakah? Test me, literally test me. So too with setting the Passover table elegantly, this should be a mitzvah that we do without holding anything back. Get your wife the most beautiful flowers you could ever possibly imagine getting her. Um, set the table with your fanciest everything that you have. Um, decorate. So I'm leading Seder this year in the old city of Jerusalem. Thank you, Hashem, my Seder. I get a window view to Harabai, uh, to where the temple hopefully will be by the time I get there. And what we're going to do is we're doing an under the sea theme and we've bought um, paper tablecloths and we're going to drape them from the roofs Moroccan style and everything's going to be blue and everyone's going to wear blue. And we're going to imagine the whole night as if we're leaving Egypt, literally. Uh, you don't have to do that theme, but any theme is encouraged. And now I'm going to just go over some other fun ones that I have here prepared for you. 
So um, first of all, you can buy really cute things like uh, socks. <laughs> Why is this night different? Um, anything that you can do, you know, I go to the Shekel store and what I do is in order to get creative, I look around and see what they have. So I saw these really ugly dolls for a Shekel and I'm going to like cross out their eyes with a Sharpie and throw them on the floor for Makat Bechorot, right? Because how else do you describe that plague? Um, another example is I bought here um, slime, red slime. And so shh, don't tell my students, but when blood comes around, we're going to have them pouring blood <laughs> for dumb. And this is a really good one for kids. Uh, you can play with the dumb. Uh, it gives a real feel. In fact, <laughs> I can't get it off my hands. So maybe you don't want to put toxic <laughs> food coloring on your hands. But if you do, you can buy this bucket of slime at the dollar store near you. <laughs> no. All right, so I'll show you the next trick. But the reason I'm showing you these tricks is not so that you need these specific tricks, but because you can really find things around your house to enhance the fun at your Seder, because as we know, the Seder is for the children. And if there aren't children at your Seder, it's for the child in you. While we are extremely stringent about setting up for Passover, once we get to the Seder, we're supposed to be chilling, enjoying, having actually enjoying our freedom. Like God didn't give us freedom just so that we can live in stress. God gave us freedom so that we can live in the freedom of joy. So that's part of the point. Okay, here's some other cool ideas. I found this uh, slimy ball at, also at the shekel store, but check it out. When you poke it, it looks like boils and then it just slurps right back up. <laughs> so anything that you have in your house that represents boils, right? You could just play around. Um, I found these little mirrors at the shekel store and um, you see they open mirrors and what I'm doing with this is I've written on it it's actually on Friday night at the table each girl is going to get one of these mirrors and we're going to do an exercise where they have to ask themselves Let's say we waved a magic wand, or let's say the real Geula has come and we're finally free of all of our internal negative voices and all those negative perceptions of myself. How would I see myself today? And this is the question that I'm asking you as well and myself is let's say we waved a magic wand and you were free of all the internal Pharaoh voices telling you how lowly you are what a slave you are, how not good enough you are. If you're free from all of those voices, how would you see, how would you perceive of yourself? What would you look like on that day? It's very important, you know, especially in the world of manifestation to already imagine seeing ourselves a certain way. Uh, this one, big stretch hand. Again, you can go to the shekel store, the dollar store and just Find whatever your store has if you feel like it and you have time, or you can find these things around your house. Um, other cute ideas here. Um, this one I got in LA at Party City, but it's amazing. It's a headband with uh, no chametz on it, and you don't necessarily need Party City to have this. All you have to do, it's not going to work. All you have to do is the cutest thing I ever saw my friend Linda Miriam. One year, she made a piece of paper and she just took a pen. And she wrote on the piece of paper, eviction notice. All chametz is expected to leave the premise for the next seven days. And I thought it was such a cute touch. You know, it probably took her two minutes. She just wrote on a piece of paper, eviction notice, chametz must exit the premise and stuck it on her door. And it's like, what, a, what an amazing way to make people laugh when they enter your house. Or you could even bring it to your host house as, you know, like a card, like, thank you for having me. I just want to let you know I've prepared your eviction notice for you. Um, then I brought these uh, little sparklers, these little sparkles, and I don't know if they're going to like it or not, but when kinim, when lice comes around, I'm going to, you know, have the madrichot throw them on the girls. Um, and here's another fun one. Uh, I bought these rackets at the dollar at the shekel store and then I bought these table tennis balls and when it comes time for hail for Barad, <laughs> we're gonna have a hail storm <laughs> and <laughs> can you imagine the cleanup after this year <laughs> oh my gosh this line is spilling all over my couch lord help me <laughs> oh god
<laughs> okay, anyhow, <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Um, those are just some cute ideas, you know, to, there's hail everywhere. <laughs> those are just some cute ideas to get you in the vibe of like, what can I look around my house? How can I enhance my Seder that we're actually looking forward to it, that it's actually really fun. Um, and of course, like you'd say, okay, so I don't have a bag of costumes, Neely, what should I do? Well, in that case, we can simply take a scarf, okay? Everybody has a scarf around their house and you take a scarf and you fold it into um, a triangle and you put it around your head or you can ask your guests to bring scarves. You take a string or a second scarf and you tie it up like that and all of a sudden you're kind of like, I don't know, Middle Eastern looking, a slave. You can wear bathrobes. That was my custom in our house growing up is that all the guests would show up in their bathrobes. Um, <laughs> I don't know why we thought that looked like slaves, but we did. Or maybe it was the relaxing part, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but my parents would actually hang blue streamers or fabrics. And as you would walk into the living room, they would be waiting on the other side of the fabric with spray bottles and they would spritz you as if you've just left Egypt. Um, and on that note, another really beautiful custom uh, that I've done with my students in the past is you have everybody at your Seder line up in two lines facing each other. And then one person takes a turn and walks through the line as if they're leaving Egypt. And it's a really beautiful meditation. The guests on the side that are as if the walls of Yamsuf can sing, or they could sing, there can be miracles, you know, or any of these songs that are redemptive, redemption song, right? Or Exodus, da -na, da -na, da -na -na. so, these are all just beautiful ideas to enhance the Seder, to make it fun. If you're reading too much text, well, it depends how you have to be careful, but there's just so many ways to enhance your Seder that it's something we actually look forward to instead of like, ah, ah, I'm dreading it, you know? So, so those are some, some beautiful ideas. Um, and now what I've done is I've gone through the Haggadah. Uh, I like to use this one, the Carly Bach Haggadah. And, um, what I've looked at is just maybe 10 or 12 different ideas throughout the Seder that really touch me. And when I get to these parts of the Seder, I feel so happy that we've arrived. Um, and I'm going to share them with you, okay? So I want to start with the idea of B'dikat Chametz. Um, and I learned something very beautiful from my teacher, Moalea Golam. She should live and be well. And she says, you know, if you think about B'dikat Chametz, it makes no sense, right? I have these like, um, <laughs> these like amazing like alien spaceship lights that I guess they installed for checking lettuce or something. So it would make sense that if I really wanted to check my house for Chametz, then I would turn on the brightest lights ever, or perhaps I'll even take a blowtorch and I'll go to the corners of my house and I'll just blowtorch them all, right? But how weird is it that when we're looking for chametz, we actually use the soft light of a candle in the dark, right? If you want to find chametz, wouldn't you like put all the lights on? So this is the most beautiful idea because everybody knows or, or some people know that when we're looking for chametz in our house, Really, what we're looking for is the chametz inside of our house that's called our body. We're looking for all those pieces of those crumbs of arrogance and ego and anger and the things that blow us up, right? Stubbornness, right? I become like bigger. Um, looking down on other people, I become bigger. So I'm looking for those inside of myself. But you know what Leah teaches? And it, it's probably from Rav Shlomo Karlibach. We, we're not meant to search ourselves with a blowtorch. We're not meant to blast ourselves with like an alien bright light. We're meant to like softly check inside of ourselves to see if we can find like some midot that we can improve. You know, we're not meant to be harsh with ourselves. In fact, if I was going to write a book, if I was going to, um, I think that the book that I would write is about the greatest Yetzer Hara that I believe plagues our generation. I literally believe there is no more uh, horrible presence in our lives 
than the voice, the mental voice of hard on ourselves. That critical inner voice that is consistently putting us down, not telling, telling us we didn't do good enough, we didn't cook good enough, we didn't clean good enough, we weren't a good enough mom, we weren't a good enough dad, like um, oh, you slept in, it's like mean to you, like whatever you do, it's that voice in your head that tells you, like Pharaoh, I'm here to motivate you. If I'm hard on you, you're going to do better. But it's like literally, in my opinion, the biggest lie of our generation that if we are hard on ourselves, we will grow more. In fact, the way that I like to phrase it in my therapy sessions uh, when explaining this to clients, it's like, you know, when we have the voice of hard on ourselves in our head, so it's like, it's kind of like someone taking, <laughs> sorry to get graphic, but it's like someone taking a poop on your head. It's like someone like pooping on you and like not less nice words will make more sense. If that happens, you don't feel very good. It's like you have a, a lump on your head, you know? And then the voice of heart on yourself says like, but if you don't clean now, you're not gonna da, da, da. And then it's like another one on your head. And then like, all of a sudden you're covered in a pile of CRAP and all of a sudden life doesn't feel good and you don't wanna do anything. You just wanna, I don't know, turn on the TV, smoke a joint, drink a glass of wine, do whatever you do to avoid, go on your phone, scroll, scroll, scroll. And so we can see that this voice is a lie. Because when the voice of heart on ourselves is talking to us about anything, about our relationships, about our house, about our minhagim, um, it's just discouraging us. And in fact, if we are gentle, like with Bidikat Hamet, we use a soft candle to kind of slowly, okay, like maybe I could do better here. Maybe I can do this. Like, okay, I, you know, I messed up in that way a few times this week, but like, I can do this, you know? Or like, I'm gonna try again. That's what Bidikat Chametz is all about. It's searching softly within ourselves, not blasting ourselves with the voice of heart on ourselves or blasting ourselves with a blowtorch. It's not it. It's not it. And if you are a fervent Torah student and you're like really into like, um, you're really into doing the Avoda for Pesach, well, don't get fooled by the Yetzir Hara. Don't get fooled by this idea that the harder on yourself you are to find your internal Chametz, the better it's going to be. This mom is not true. Just trying to fix the screen to the to a good level here for me. Okay, so I love this. I love this idea of being gentle with ourselves, the same way that the custom teaches us to be. Or else it would have been wiser to have us do it in broad daylight. But no, that's not what the chachamim say, and we are supposed to learn a lesson for ourselves with this. Um, secondarily, in terms of b'dika chametz, there is an idea. Um, it's a really sweet custom that you take on a piece of paper. Let's say you have 10 pieces of chametz around the house wrapped in a tinfoil and you write 10 pieces of paper. It just takes one minute or maybe like 10 minutes and you write all of the midot that you also want help eliminating and eradicating from your life. So for me, it would be like uh, anger, uh, insecurity, judgment, criticism, the critical nature, negativity, uh, ego. So all of these qualities, I really want Hashem to help take out of me. And so what I'll do is on each piece of chametz, I'll shove one of those notes in there. Um, and then when I'm burning the chametz, it's as if I'm at a prayer, I'm asking to Hashem to burn up those qualities within me as well. Okay, so that was burning of the chametz. The next thing I want to address is Kaddish, right? Kaddish, Urchat, Karpaz, Yachat, Kaddish. Why do we start with Kaddish? Well, Reb Shlomo explains the following thing. He says, you cannot begin the Seder, the Seder being the night where we explain our legacy to the Jewish children. You cannot begin the Seder without the most important thing. And this follows suit perfectly with the Torah of B'dikat Chametz. And that's the following. You got, if you are the leader of your Seder, the most important thing everybody has to know is you're so holy. Kadesh, Kadesh. Everybody here is so holy, so precious. How can we even begin to start a Seder without this realization? I mean, it's not even just at our Seder. It's like we are still doing this after 2,000 years without a break. 
There has never been a year, as far as I learned, in all of human history that since we left Egypt, there has not been a single year in history, even in the ghettos, even in the, in the, the, the Holocaust, there's not been a single year where people didn't eat matzah. We're so holy. Here we are after 2,000 years. I was listening to a shir online and the guy said, tonight we uphold the legacy of the Jewish people from one side of the world to the next, right? Even the people we consider the most distant from us, even the people using the Maxwell Haggadah, even the people who keep nothing else, they come and they sit at a Seder and they eat matzah. And here we are 2000 years later, reaffirming our commitment to the Jewish people, our commitment to improving ourselves and ridding ourselves of ego and getting closer to God. We are so holy. You know, one time um, when I was still letting the voice of heart of myself plague me a little more and I was a little bit more balchuva e, I was sitting at a table with friends and I was in which is, you know, notorious for like our chillness or, you know, our vibe to be easygoing or whatever, like, you know, just like, let's say more lenient. And I was all impassioned. And, and I said, like, I just don't understand. I just don't understand why everybody is not Shomer Nagia. I just don't understand why everybody is not blah, blah, blah. I just don't understand. And I'm like, I don't understand why everyone's not more serious about their Judaism. And it was so balchuva -y. And this one brother, uh, Yaakov Berger, may he be blessed in Mazel Tov. They just had a baby, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. Uh, he said, you know, Neely, I don't know who you hang out with, but like everybody I know, like, and of course we hang out with the same people, right? This is the message. He's like, they get up and they pray every day. The guys like go to Minyan three times a day. Everybody's got a kosher home. Everybody's more tzanua than the rest of the world. Everybody's learning Torah. In fact, everybody I know is like obsessed with God and Torah. And I was like, wow, good point. Thank you for helping me chill out. And thank you, God, and the sheer person who said to me, like, literally from one corner of the world to the next, even, even lost tribes that are reemerging. I mean, I, I've told you before, I had the privilege of doing Seder in Zimbabwe with 200 people, in Ethiopia with 800 people, in Rwanda with like 50 expats, in... I'm missing somewhere. In India, people traveled 500 kilometers just to recite the Alenu, to show me that their child knew it. So literally all across the world, Reform Jews, Reconstructionist Jews, Conservative Jews, Modern Orthodox Jews, Haredi, look, well, here we are, we're so holy. And the first things first, if we wanna continue the legacy of the Jewish people is to start looking positively with eyes also on ourselves. You think you didn't have time to prepare for Pesach? You're going to show up at the Seder. You're so holy. You know what? Even if you're not going to show up at the Seder for Pesach, I'm sure you have a reason for that too. And it's probably because of a deep internal struggle with God. And that just means you're so close to God, right? Rav Shlomo Katz tells the story of this one guy who came to him. And he's like, Rav Shlomo, I feel so far from God. And Shlomo's like, wow, I'm so jealous of you, brother. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? And Shlomo's like, I wish I felt far from God. Like, do you even know how close you are for feeling far from God? I'm jealous. So yeah, Kadesh, Kadesh. We're so holy and we need to know that. We're not just holy. We're literally children of the king. We're princes. We're princesses. We're regal. And that's what all the leaning is about on Seder, right? Now lean back. Now lean back. <laughs> to the left, to the left. You can use those two songs in your Seder if you want. <laughs> Um, so a bit more on Kadesh. I just want to read you this beautiful passage from the Haggadah. Because there's the aspect of seeing ourselves as holy, and then there's the aspect of holiness and slavery. So Shlomo says like this, in this world, when you want to show you're the master, you put yourself above others by putting them down. Chas v'shalom. But with God, how does he show that he's the master? He says, I lift, up, I lift others up. And you remember, when we were Pharaoh slaves in Egypt, we were downhearted. We were broken. But then we became servants of God, of the true master. And you know what God does for us? He lifts us up. So according to our holy tradition, 
we lift up the cup of wine. And Rav Shlomo is suggesting that you lift up the cup of wine on Kadesh and all the different times we're drinking wine to your heart to know that who are we serving now if we're not a master to Pharaoh? We're a master to God. And God's mastery says, listen, if I'm in charge of you, you know what I want from you? I want you to see yourself like you already left Egypt. I want you to know how holy you are. I want you to lift up and to lift everybody else up with your heart. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It really is. It's so, so beautiful. Um, yeah. Okay. Urchatz, uh, Karpas, Yachatz. And thank you, God. Right before this, I was just um, opening up Facebook and this post from this holy healer brother in LA, Benzion Simmons, posted this super cool thing about Yachatz. And now I get to share it in his name. He should be blessed. So Yachatz is spelled Yud Che Tzadi, right? So he says that if you scramble the letters, you get Chai Tzadik. And his interpretation of this, or perhaps he learned it from somewhere, is that yachatz, when you split the afikomen, what you hide and what you're going to find is your tzaddik, right? Tzaddik chai. We want to find our inner tzaddik for the whole year long. It's the same theme. You know, Seder is not telling us like, you are slaves, you are oppressed, you are low, and now you're stuck in the desert. It's like any Mitzrayim you're in, Hashem's role in your life and your role in your life is to lift yourself up. So you're stuck in a Mitzrayim of addiction. Mazel tov, welcome to the club. So you're stuck in a Mitzrayim of anger. Mazel tov, welcome to the club. So you're stuck in a Mitzrayim of having a difficult relationship with someone in your family or your spouse. Mazel tov, welcome to the club. We are all perpetually stuck in Mitzrayim, but every year we're reminded to lift ourselves up and to remember that we do have an inner tzaddik or else God wouldn't have redeemed us in the first place. Okay, so then we get to Magid, right? We covered some really fun customs. I officially have slime all over my blankets. <laughs> um, we discussed Kadesh and now we're skipping over to Yachatz. Um, pardon me, we just did Yachatz, we're skipping to Magid where we really tell the story. And the question is, this is like the central theme of the whole Seder, okay? Magi, tell the story. But why? We know the story. We learn the story. Oh, and if you really tell the story, you're praiseworthy. But don't take too long, so you have to get to Afi Komen. But what's the deal with the story? Why do we have to tell the story? Again, if you're learning Torah and you make it a history book or you make it about the past, so it's, it's, it will be a challenge, maybe. For me, it would be a challenge it, it, to touch my heart. And what doesn't touch my heart goes in one ear and out the next. So how does Magi touch my heart? Because it's not just the story of the Jews in Egypt. It's my story. Hashem's like, tell me the story of your life. Really, what is the story of your life? Because you know what? With all this realizing that we're holy and we're tzaddikim and how important we are and how we're preserving the legacy, we also have to realize we are works in progress. We are works in progress. And there is a greater story going on. David Sachs in LA always says, you know, if you meet someone and you're judging them, just remember, you're really catching them in the middle of a story. We're all in the middle of our story. None of us are in that place of potential where we see ourselves like, oh, I have potential. Like, we're never there. That, that actually potential is a complete and total lie. We're just here. We're just ourselves, humbly trying our best, hopefully humbled by that which we could see we can be, but we're not yet hopefully grateful of what has passed, but we all have a story. And Magid is not just about the story of the Seder. It's also the story of your life. In fact, on Friday night, I'm going to be telling my life story to my students as a way to introduce to them this concept that it's time to reflect on our story, where it's been, to give ourselves empathy for the pain, and to see where we want it to go. And what does serving God as a free person look like for us? If you don't answer that question, you're just doing a history lesson, right? Really, because the slaves came out and now they're here to serve God to soon, you know, after they get through the desert or soon after to receive the Torah, to then enter Eretz Yisrael, which is like being embodied. So don't just leave Egypt to leave Egypt. Leave Egypt because there's some wisdom that God is trying to give to you so that you can then enter into the land of Eretz Yisrael, which is the metaphor for being embodied. 
So what does that look like for you? In every generation, this vision is incumbent upon us. We're actually supposed to think about it and ask about it. And um, one of my favorite Torahs also from the splitting of the sea is very, very connected to this because it says in the Midrashim, I want a drink. Pause. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, she'akol mi'apivaroch. It says in the Midrashim that there was, there was like 50 miracles that happened as we left through Yom Suf. But one of the awesomest ones is that as we we're walking through the walls, there are these like amazing, like amazing mosaics on the wall. And for every person, it was different. So what were these mosaics? Well, apparently what you were seeing as you were leaving Egypt, going through to be a servant of God and not of Pharaoh, not of the meanness, para, and the hard critical voice, but of God who lifts you up and tells you you're a tzaddik, you're seeing what these mosaics are, is you're seeing all the disparate pieces of your life coming together to form a story, the story of your life. And when we saw these mosaics of all the pieces coming together, it was like so beautiful. So part of leaving Egypt is remembering that we're just works in progress. We're in the middle of our story. We don't know what greatness and grandeur await us. We don't know what potential we will fulfill in the future, but we do have greater odds if we throw out that hard blowtorch voice, start speaking to ourselves gently and be willing to let Hashem lift us up, be willing to be bigger than we could even ever imagine being. Okay, now in Magid, we begin with Manishtana. And I just wanna mention this quick note that Manishtana, when the children sing, because the children are like our connection to Shammai, Mamish, like, as I've said, like, I'm 37, right? So if I'm hanging out with a kid, like my friend Lanny's daughter, Sophia, is like the cutest thing ever, tfu, 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 she's four. I've been away from Shammai and my direct connection to God for all these years. But she, she's only four years away. A baby? Forget it. They're like a direct channel to Shammai. So when the children open up the heavens with these questions, Manishtana, this is the opportune time to pray your heart out. Yes, it's cute. Listen to the children, honor the children, respect the children for sure. And this is just one of those segulot. It's like an auspicious, favorable time. When you hear Manishtana, let it, let it loose. Ask for everything. On Seder night, you know, it says by the Chida, we'll talk about this later, that by Seder night, um, well, as it also opens in the Gemara by talking about Or La Arbasra, that this night, if you could see with spiritual eyes, literally lights up the entire world, the potential, the spiritual potential to tune into Hashem and your needs and pray on this night are, while you're having fun, also don't stop praying. Okay, so, phew. Yeah, I don't know if we're gonna get to the Parsha. <laughs> okay, but it's, I'm having fun, I hope you are. Okay, so now, um, and also I really love when people write in the comments, it makes me so happy to know what, what's interesting to you, other customs that you might have that you can share with people, uh, if anything touched your heart, it means a lot to me to see that. Okay, so now, after Manishtana, we get to Dayenu, and I want to share this kavan, I think I've shared it already five times, but my friend's daughter, Alia, she should be well, she's love of my life. She was learning the song. She's two, right? She's not even two. She's maybe, she, I don't know. Oh, bad auntie. Anyways, <laughs> just kidding. I'm a really good auntie. I just don't remember. <laughs> but um, she was trying to learn the song Dayenu. And just as a child, you know, sometimes the words get mixed up and she wasn't singing Dayenu. She was singing Dai Dai Ani. Like instead of Dai Dayenu, she was going Dai Dai Ani, Dai Dai Ani. And my friend Linda told me about this. I was like, that is the most profound Torah in the world. Here she is. And this, this two-year-old is obviously already freed from the, the Pharaoh mindset. But as an adult, we aren't. And the number one thing the Pharaoh mindset tells us is work harder. You're not good enough. And here in this little slip of tongue, she brought down like a Hasidic vort. Die, die, Ani. I'm enough. I'm enough. I'm good enough. And I'll keep trying. But right now I'm enough. And I could celebrate myself for everything I've done until this very day, for all the slaveries I did pass through and the fact that I still have my head a little up. Dai, dai, ani. Okay. 
on to matzah. Here we go. Because soon at this point in the Seder, we're going to be washing for matzah. Okay, so now some Torahs from David Sachs in LA. He says that matzah is gematria 190. Now, this is very interesting because we were meant to be enslaved for 400 years. But Hashem had compassion on us. We were only enslaved for 210 years. The difference between that is 400 to 10, 190. So what does this mean? If matzah is 190, then what he explains is when I'm eating the matzah, he says, you got to do it with your eyes closed, right? You're in total relaxing. By the way, I learned uh, in Sephardi Halacha, because I'm preparing to work at a Sephardi seminary for Seder, that in reclining, you actually do not fulfill the mitzvah if you're uncomfortable like this. Oh, no, I learned it from some other guy. Anyways, he says that really, if you want to recline properly, you should really get your pillow and put it on your chair. Okay, my chair's a little low, but rest your head, like as if you're actually resting. Because when we lean uncomfortably, we're actually not fulfilling the mitzvah of being comfortable. So you should actually do whatever you can to get truly comfortable. Like even if it means like putting your head down on the chair, even if it seems weird. And he says that you literally have to close your eyes when you're eating the matzah, not to miss this opportunity. What the matzah does for us spiritually is really massive. Um, so yes, to close our eyes. And then what's the thing with the gematria? We says that the matzah, as if then, was filling in the gap. In other words, it was getting our decrees over quickly. In other words, we were supposed to stay in slavery all that time, but because of the matzah, because of the humility that we did have, because of the lessening of the ego that we did do, because of our faith in God. So this decree was shortened. So what he's saying is you can have the intention while eating your matzah that this very matzah that I'm eating should help me get past those degrees and fill in the gap where I was decreed. I don't know what I said a minute ago, but I was decreed something heavy in Shemaim. Let this matzah compensate for it. Um, and I really appreciate that, you know? Okay. Next, uh, skipping to Afi Kuman. Da -dun, da -da -da -da. What a fun thing, right? Wasn't that like the best thing of your childhood? I still remember the hardest place my dad hit it. He had these like sliding doors into our living room and he put it on top. And I was so mad because I was the littlest kid. I could never reach it, but it was a really smart hiding place. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about the Afi Komen and what's so beautiful from Rev Shlomo's book, um, from the Kojnitzer Magid. He says, you know, the Afi Komen is broken, right? And he says, the world is so broken. We are so broken. But our children can make the world whole again. We break the matzah, the small piece we keep, and the big piece, the bigger brokenness, our children take away. Then they bring it back to us to make us whole again, to serve as the afikomen at the end of the Seder. Our children, they are the ones that take the brokenness away from us. Is that so beautiful? It's so, so beautiful. But now maybe you might think, oi, but I don't have kids. So who's going to who's gonna compensate for my brokenness? Oh, and by the way, an amazing hashkacha, even though we might not get to the parsha, is being that it is Shabbat HaGadol, we have a special haftarah. And in this Haftarah, um, the last line is um, levavot el banim, that the idea, I'm not sure if I said that right, but the idea that the children in the final generations before Mashiach, they're going to be the ones doing the healing for their parents. There, you know, we could even see it in our generation, like our parents' generation was less into consciousness and me don't work. They're just kind of doing their thing and trying to make it. Our generation is like infused with Torah and growth and ability to connect and ability to communicate. And, and for us, it is incumbent upon us to try to offer that loving, compassionate, connective energy to our parents. And again, what do I do if I don't have children? Well, we all have children. It's called little Neely, little you. We all have that little inner child in us. And anyone who's into the practice of therapy knows 
that it's always about addressing our inner child, um, being for them the parent they didn't have, being for them the teacher they needed, being for our inner child what the sibling they needed they didn't have, giving that little version of yourself, whatever he or she is stuck, whatever trauma age is there, the empathy and the love that when we're doing afikoman, it's not just about a broken matzah. It's about the broken pieces of ourselves. And can we offer ourselves that wholeness, whatever it will take to offer myself the love, the compassion, the tears, the praise, the sweetness that I, that I maybe not me specifically, but that I never got. Can I do that through my inner child as well? So the afikoman is both beautiful for those that have physical children and that don't yet or won't, but they should be blessed. So I thought that was super, super beautiful. Okay. Uh, and along those lines, if you don't have your children yet because you haven't found your soulmate, check out this super cool teaching. Okay. So I was learning about the different kavanot for the four glasses of wine. And they all represent the four different geulas, uh, the redemptions, the yeshuot. And the first one is for, um, oh, for the initial redemption in Egypt. The second one is going to be for the impending geula, please God, now. Wait for it. Okay, soon. The third cup of wine, and this is such a trip, is actually for, in honor of the aspect of geula that will come to us when after mechaye metim, and I'm sorry, I forgot where I learned this. I don't know. After Mechaye Metim, we all know that we are going, or some of us have learned this Torah, that all of Am Yisrael is going to, whether it's metaphorical or physically, sit in a massive sukkah all together around the Beit HaMikdash. And this sukkah will be different from the usual sukkah because of its hugeness and unity, of course. Even though in general sukkahs, we really are all sitting in one sukkah, we just can't see it. But in this particular sukkah, we don't use palm fronds or olive branches or pine branches and leaves. Um, what, what will be used for the schach instead is um, the skin of the Leviathan, of this massive, like the Loch Ness monster, the Leviathan, this massive creature that's beneath the ocean. And by the way, like not even necessarily metaphorically, we really do not know what's in most of our oceans scientifically. If you want to study oceanology, is that a word? Ocean, oceanic sciences? I don't know. Um, but we really don't know what's in most of the bottom of the ocean. We cannot access it, even with our most like uh, amazing technologies. So anyways, we're supposed to sit in this sukkah of the Leviathan. And the third glass of wine, for some reason, celebrates this geula. And so what the rabbi was explaining was this cool thing. It says about the Leviathan, it says that the third glass of wine you could have a special kavana for your zivugamiti, for your personal soulmate, or for anyone else you know. Everybody knows someone who would love to find their soulmate already. Please, God Hashem, for everybody. Now, um, he says, why is the third glass of wine that is made for the sitting under the sukkah of the Leviathan a special segula for your soulmate? Well, check this out. So the Leviathan, this Leviathan, this massive, massive creature that Hashem created, apparently when he created it, he actually created two. Even though creating two had potential to really destroy parts of the world and the earth because they were so big and kind of, I guess, floppity or not in control of their bodies, even still, even with the potential to destroy the world, Hashem says, I do not create any creature without their soulmate. So good news for the Jews. Third cup, Chaim, to a hundred million chuppahs this year or whoever needs or whoever wants. Amen. So that's something really beautiful about the third cup. Okay, next. Finally, 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 we approach the end of the Seder and it's time for Eliyahu Hanavi. So I want to share two Torahs on this. One, the Shlomo Karlibach Hasidim. And I've done this, uh, I've done this with my, my family up north. Um, when it gets to Eliana V, they have prepared candles, like those long kind that you could like hold with tinfoil at the bottom. 
and they use their ner neshama because remember Passover is a chag and on chag there are different permissions of what you can do with fire. It's not like Shabbat where you mamish can't use fire. On chag, if you're transferring it for a certain sorach and check with your local rabbi what's kosher for you or not, but this is a custom that Rav Shlomo Karlibach used to do and I've done it around from people, but again, don't, I'm not your halacha posek. Um, you light your candle from the ner neshama and everybody leaves the Seder with their own candle. And it's like, if you had a holy guest, if you're excited to see someone, you don't wait till they come to the door and open it. If you hear they're coming, you run out of your door and you go to greet them. Eliyahu Navi coming with good news. It's like, we couldn't ask for anything more. It's like dreamy. And so we wanna create that beautiful welcome for him and really really believe that he's there you know like let yourself be a child this year I really bless you I really have the privilege in my head of being like a child for the good and the bad uh, but for the good I really try to feel Eliyahu Navi there and, I, and then at that moment when we all go outside with our candles and everybody at your seder is now outside in the dark with candles first of all how beautiful. Second of all, we need to move our legs a little bit. And third of all, this is another very auspicious time to pray, right? At Manishtana, we prayed our hearts out here with Eliyahu Navi. We're not talking about good news and geula for the world. I mean, we are, but don't forget every single one of us is a part of that geula. And we're not going to have a worldwide messianic redemption without every one of us having our own tikkun shalem, our own complete soul fixing. So I invite us, when we sing Eliyahu Navi, check out this custom. Even if you're a guest, you can hook up your hosts. You could bring the candles with tinfoil. You could use tea lights, if you please. Those are more accessible and easy, but they get a bit hot. Um, so it's just such a beautiful custom. And then, you know, we read this really weird paragraph after we welcome Eliyahu Navi, And it's like, it's like pour out your wrath upon the nations. So Shlomo in his awesome way has a different, Chidush on this. He says, don't pour out your wrath. Pour out your chamimut, your, your warmth. Let the nations know that they're invited to come serve God with us at the house of love and prayer for all nations, right? The temple was for everybody. And he said, you know why the world is brogus at us? Because we didn't tell them Shabbat Shalom too, because we didn't include them. So maybe this time in Seder, instead of pouring out our wrath upon the nations, we pour our warmth. We give them benefit of the doubt. We show them love. Um, okay. Now, so that's that's basically that's like basically my favorite Pesach Seder Torahs in just like a sum up of what I could fit into an hour. But now I kind of want to just take a step back and give us some more concepts and questions. I really did want to connect us to the Parsha, but maybe we'll do a bonus share. We'll close and then start another one right away. Um, so here's like this. Those are all great kavano and great ways to have fun. But like, what about the fact that like, I didn't cover my counters yet. I haven't cooked anything yet. Uh, it's stressful in the house. The kids aren't listening. My husband vacuumed, but then he exploded the vacuum and now it's a bigger, like, what about the practical reality? Let's get out of fairy landed bubbles for a moment. So you know how there's this idea that on Shabbat, on Erev Shabbat, the Yetzirah comes to mess with families? Well, guess what? The Chida says that the Yetzirah, special for Pesach, you know, if you are Persian in LA, special for you. <laughs> so, and I, I think I learned this from Eliyahu Kitov also, but the Chida says, special for, special for you. Okay, special for you, I will bring the Yetzirah to mess with you. Dafka on Erev Pesach, the Yetzirah is coming in strong. Dafka et Seder, it's coming in strong. Because you have to remember, the purpose of the Yetzirah, it's, it's got to go, it's got a rule, it's got a job to do. It is told, suppress all the light. Suppress the light of every single person. So put those mean voices in their head if it'll make them not go do something or suppress the light of a household if that household, if it wasn't Shalom Bay, could like illuminate the world. So here we are with an opportunity to literally illuminate the world. Go figure if you've been fighting with the people you love. Go figure if you're dealing with stress, it's okay. 
It's plan A. It's like the snake in Gan Aden, right? That wasn't random, you know. It's actually, I was going to Daven by the Arizal this week, and there was I have a big pair of snakes, and there was a snake on the stair, and I'm like, okay, Hashem, thanks a lot. Like, nice message, you know, right as we're coming out of Egypt, but you're not alone. The more the Yitzhar Hara is attacking you with stress and panic and fighting, you can interpret it this way. The more light and the more potential you have to illuminate the world. It wouldn't attack you if you had no reason to attack you. Like if you were threatened by somebody coming at you, then you would have to get on defense, right? But only because you're threatened. But if there's like a wimpy kind of nerdy, scrawny kid coming at you, you don't have to get on defense. So the idea, <laughs> I don't know if that metaphor worked, but the idea being is if you do feel the stress and the pressure of Passover, if you are fighting with the people that you love, it's a setup and it only means that you have a lot of light, okay? So again, let's take that B'dikat Chametz law and apply it to all of Seder, right? And here's the funny thing. We all want every single year, or at least I'll only speak for myself, every year I want these like glorious Sedarim and I want it to be amazing and I want it to be profound and I want it to be deep and I want to connect with the people there and I, and I want to have a spiritual experience and I want the food to be good. And it's like, whoa, 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 chill out a little bit. <laughs> because those high expectations are kind of just a setup. It's, it is the highest night of the year in one way. And on the other hand, it's kind of meant to be a balagan. It, it is, it's, it's meant to be all out of whack. All the laws are all out of whack. We wash our hands there, we do this, we dip vegetables, we do like everything is completely out of order. And that is the whole point, why Seder is the highest, because our lives are a mess. <laughs> and they, they, they often don't turn out the way we want them to. Or, you know, I was at a Shabbat meal that like I was had such high expectations for it and it was kind of like, meh. And like, I could get really tripped up in, in Egypt mentality if I'm like, ah, all harsh about it or this or that. It's like, the idea of Seder is Hakol Seder, like we discussed last week. It's all good. Like if your Seder is stellar, awesome, Baruch Hashem. If your Seder is kind of lame or even bad or confusing or you get upset, Baruch Hashem, Hakol Seder, that too was meant to happen like that. Right, The idea, like we were saying last week, Kabbalistically, when they say that all of the fixings of the world are in Seder night, Hakol Ba Seder, not just Hakol Ba Seder, Hakol Be Seder, also the flops, also the flips, as we remember with the mosaics, we're in the middle of our story and we're a work in progress. And even though we have to be kind of uptight getting into Seder, once we get there, let's just surrender to the beautiful messiness of life. And you know, another teaching that I found super beautiful, and both in this week's Parsha, and maybe that's just a little quick intro into this week's Parsha, both in this week's Parsha and preparing for Seder. So I'll just tell you on one foot, because we're not, well, we're not really going to get there. Um, uh, I'm excited that Alam Haba is like learning Torah all day long. There's no time limits. Um, the idea, as it says, Satsav is all about, it's kind of like an extension of last week's Parsha. Um, in Vayikra, it talks about all the sacrifices and all the different offerings, which is super applicable to Pesach because Pesach essentially really revolves around the Pesach offering, which is a ritual slaughter. So actually, first, if you just look at the Parsha, you're like, what's up with all the sacrifices? And, you know, if you're telling me the Torah has to do with the time, what does that have to do with Pesach? Because well, Pesach really is all about the slaughtering of the Pesach animal. And then we take the blood and we put it on the doorposts. Like I said, they're still doing in Chebrolu, India. They're still putting the blood on the doorposts. And then this sacrifice, so the angel of death passed over us. It was be in, in the merit of this sacrifice. Well, that's what the Parsha is all about, is the merit and the details of these sacrifices. But one thing that we learn, both in Parsha Tzav and in preparation for Passover, when um, checking if we can kosher our kelim, if we can make our vessels kosher, uh, as you know, like you could take your glass to the dip place and you can make it kosher for Passover. And if it's this and if it's that, you can and you can't. But there is one type of vessel that cannot be koshered for Passover unless. And that type is ceramics or earthenware pottery. 
So a few years ago, I had this like, boom, lightning inspiration that struck me. And I realized, so, oh, first I'll tell you. Okay, so, so earthenware cannot be kosher, okay? What do you have to do to kosher earthenware, like pottery, ceramics? You'd actually have to smash it. And the irony is, well, it's not really a vessel anymore, but it is kosher. <laughs> you know, it's like, so what? Because I realized this deepest, deepest thing is that we are earthenware vessels. We are. That's literally what we are. We're vessels. We're made from the earth. We are earthenware vessels. And in order to get kosher a little bit, we smash, we break, we fall apart like the afikomen, like everything that happens in the Seder and before the Seder, we're a little bit, a little bit broken. And it's okay. Because, you know, there's, I think it's a Rabbi Nachman idea that every time you want to grow up into, let's say, a new bandwidth, or a, a different way of saying that is every time I want to like expand my consciousness and become a higher, holier person, right? Or I want to grow. Basically, I want to work on me, my bidot. I want to improve. I want to, let's say, we call it a higher level, even though there's not really higher or lower. Every time that happens, says Rabbi Nachman, we go through a mikvah, like a spiritual mikvah, but it's actually a mikvah of fire. It's not easy. It's life. My friend Ariella said to me the other day, when asking me how LA was, I was like, it was so easy and beautiful. She's like, yeah, but that's not what this world is meant to be, <laughs> you know? And it's true. Anytime that we're growing, it, it might just feel like we're going through a mikvah of fire because we're earthenware vessels and we don't get koshered without breaking first. We just don't. And maybe that's why Seder is so intense to prepare and to get ready for, because a little bit to get to the next level, to leave Egypt, to get higher, a little bit we have to break. And it's okay, because then we'll kosher and we'll start again. <sighs> I'm uh, taking a moment of Zen to figure out uh, with like seven extra hours of shear I prepared how I want to like bring this together or what I want to do next. So just do my moment. Okay, yeah, so uh, what I'll say is like this. So up, uh, so what we did today was we talked about some really fun Seder ideas, and then we went through um, many different aspects of the Seder, including decorating your table, the eviction notice, um, how we search, we search gently, burning your um, chametz with perhaps midot, Kadesh, realizing the first thing is just knowing how holy we are and how holy every single person at our Seder is. Yachat, the idea that the tzaddik chai, that, that when we split the afikomen, we're going to hide and find this inner tzaddik for the whole year. Magid, not just the story of Egypt, but the story of your life, remembering we're work in progress, seeing those mosaics of all the pieces of your life coming together as you left Egypt. Um, we talked about the Af um, Dayenu, we talked about the Matzah, eating it with your eyes closed, asking for Hashem that it should be as if filling in the gap, that we should no longer have to suffer any harsh decrees, that the eating of this Matzah with my eyes closed and the intention and the prayer should mashlim everything so we can each personally have Tikkun Shalem and come home immediately with Geula Shlema. We talked about the Afikomen um, and how the children bring back the brokenness. And if that's your real children, awesome. But if it's the child in you, awesome. And parents can also work on their inner child work. We talked about Eliyahu and Avi going out and lighting candles and pouring forth our warmth upon the nation. Uh, we talked about what the Chida says about the Yetzir Hara coming to us during Seder and like letting go of expectations because no matter how it turns out, it's plan A and Hakoba Seder. Um, we talked about being a ceramic or an earthenware vessel. And um, so I want to conclude this and then I'll decide if I want to open up part two um, with just sharing that other things to note as we're coming into this holiday is this Shabbat is Shabbat Hagadol. Technically speaking, uh, hold on, I'll get one more prop. <laughs> Technically speaking, that's when we tie me to the bedpost. We tied the lambs to the bedpost, which is when we made our declaration that we were, you know, tying up the Egyptian gods to serve our own. Um, and then after Shabbat HaGadon, after Pesach, we start the counting of the Omer, um, which is really cool. 
Um, but all of this, this whole process is not just so we could have Pesach and so we could count the Omer. The whole process is because we're leaving Egypt to then receive the Torah, like we said, this divine wisdom. To then, after we receive the Torah, please God, Veheveti, the fifth language of redemption, to come home to the land of Israel, to be in it. But you know what? With all the stress, we want to do all of this, this whole process to receive the wisdom, to become embodied, besimcha, because if we're blowing up the details of it, then we're doing what my friend Ilana Shushan says is chametz in the first place. I've blown it up. I've made a big deal. And that is, of course, all ego. So my blessing to us for Seder is uh, to just have the blessing of Hashem, Hashem, please help us just be as chill as we can. And when we can't, because we're growing and we're going through the mikvah fire and we're breaking to become kosher, then Hashem, please let us go of the Pharaoh that puts the mean voice in our head that we think motivates us, but it's a lie. And really the kindest words of like Hashem lifts us up as our master. Let's pay attention to those voices in our head. If they're demeaning me and degrading me, it's Pharaoh. And then I'm enslaved. And if they're uplifting me and they're kind to me, then that's, that's the voice of God. That's the voice of my soul um, for this Pesach. Okay, so I made an affirmative decision as I was talking. What I really wanna share with you for your own time is if you have Book of Our Heritage, and maybe I'll take time to photograph it afterwards, on page 564 of the Nissan, which is the second volume, 554, 555 to five, pardon me, 564, all the way through 568 is the most unbelievable accounting of what Pesach was like in the temple. I highly recommend it. I will try to post it afterwards so that you can read it. When I read this, I had a completely different understanding of what Pesach was like historically because Rabbi Eliyahu Kitov brings an eyewitness account from the book Shevet Mi Yehuda. And it literally just describes the koanim, the sacrifices and the golden spoons and the silver spoons and the blood. And there was millions of people and the singing and the levim and the temple and the sacrifices. Like, it really brings you back to what Pesach and the temple was like because it's, it's just a whole different experience. So I really, really bless you. If you have access to that, check it out. Again, I will try to post it in the comments as well. Um, if you want some extra, <laughs> if you have all this extra time on your hands before Seder. Um, and so on that note, thank you so much Hashem for this, what I thought was a really fun class. And thank you JIC for hooking me up and always, you know, just supporting me through this. And uh, I'll play a little music, uh, go back to the beginning of where we started and uh, have a beautiful kasher, chag kasher v'sameach. Thank you so much for learning with me. I appreciate it so much. Party people in the house tonight.